Alright, so today's lecture is uh, mass politics and the rise of the second party system. Alright, and I want, alright, so let's kind of focus in again. Um, on voting rules and laws when the country was founded, okay? That... This is Roy Keepers contacting me, this is Mrs. Roy. Roy. appropriate lesson for today. It's election day. Um, 435 representatives, 36 senators, several thousand state representatives, 19 governors, school boards, etc. etc. all around the country. Senator no, in the school. Yeah, it's election day. Yeah, but the teachers? Oh, the teachers? No, people who live in this district. They come here? Yeah. They Every, you, you, all of you in your election districts have your own polling place. Like, if you live by here, you come here. Right, if you live by here. You another, another school, you go to another school. Like There's nothing to do with where you go. It this just happens to be a public place where you can vote. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the school. I mean, my mom goes. Like, schools are often, I mean, I'm going to, when I go to vote tonight, I'm voting at Evergreen Elementary School in Scotch Plains. You know? Because that's the only place near my where. You live. Right. Like, if you, if you, you, are, you have an assigned polling place with your address. Your address is in a particular place. My place is the second thing. That's where you are. You sent an absentee ballot. What? Like, <laughs> like the answer is you, know, you don't vote from your living room in this country. In New no, Jersey, I mean, like, yes. what if I Your name is not on the thing. You can't vote. <laughs> like, you, you I mean, try to so maintain the integrity of elections so you can't vote more than one time. You know what they say in Chicago vote early and vote off. You're not supposed to be able to vote off. All right. In 1789, we're talking about limitations on voting. Who is allowed and not allowed to vote? Some of them we are aware of the categories. There are still three categories of people that cannot vote. Who? Children. No, in today, still, 2014. Non-civilians. Non-citizens. Non-citizens. Right, so if you're under the age of 18, if you are not a citizen, if you're out of the country, you can vote. If you are mentally insane, people who are judged by the courts to be mentally insane cannot vote, and people who are convicted felons cannot vote. And those are our restrictions. In England, for a long time, actors couldn't vote. Why? Because they make a living. Why? Anyway, interesting historical trivia aside. Um, in 1789 in the North, we know that there are large categories of people that cannot vote, starting with women cannot vote. Blacks cannot vote. And what's the other, so that we kind of, we, we know this to be historically true, but what else did you have to do on that? You needed to own property. Now, in the north, it's not a lot. And it differs state to state. Voting rules are done by state. 
So some states, if you are a convicted felon after a certain number of years, you can vote. Some states, you can never vote. It's different by state. at federalism. But in the North, there were property qualifications, but they were not high. Um, it's, and again, it differed by state. In Massachusetts, for example, if you owned a set of tools, you know, you could vote. That was enough property to give you the right to vote. Um, in the South, it's the same thing. Women cannot vote. Blacks cannot vote. But the property qualifications in the South were higher. Okay? Higher property qualifications. You know, if you kind of go with kind of a modern example, in the South, you had to own your own farm. And they might have even put an acreage requirement on it. You have to have a farm of 50 acres to vote. If you don't have a farm of 50 acres, you are not eligible to vote in the South. Isn't that the all the your no, the yeomanry all had farms that time. So, yeah, exactly. who, so who is voting in the South? Yomari the yeomanry and I. Which is not too many Which is a, about 40, maybe 30, 35, 40 percent of white eligible men. Okay? In the North, it's higher. But as the years and you know, decades kind of roll into the 1800s, 1810s, 1820s, People make the argument that property qualifications should no longer be a requirement for voting. So by about 1820, 1830, and again, it's different state to state, that if we look at the history of New Jersey, it's going to look different from the history of Pennsylvania, different from the history of Virginia, different from the history of Ohio. But I'm just talking broad general trends here. By about 1830, the property qualifications are gone. Except in some southern states. But by and large, throughout most of the country, by the 1820s, by 1830, at the latest, no more property qualifications for voting. Meaning, what class of people has now come to the ballot? Poor people. Poor people. Working people, poor people, people without property. By the 1820s and 30s are voting. And this is going to change the nature of American elections. So let's keep this fact in mind. Okay. First party system, which some of you, unfortunately small number, are aware of. First party system, your Federalists and your Jeffersonian Republicans, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, your first five presidents are all elected, by and large, by an electorate made up of the yeomanry, the middle class, and up. That poor people, or whites, do not vote in the United States during the first party system. So elections reflect that fact. what the election of 1800 looked like on the ground, and then how that changed by the time of Jackson, you know, a quarter century later. Adams and Jefferson did not run for office. You used to talk about this yesterday. What, 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 what was the verb that they used? They stood, they stood for office. 
their supporters and intermediaries conducted their campaigns for them. Oh, that's where the word media came from, right? Oh, oh never mind. Sure <laughs> I I they didn't run for office, they stood for office. You know, campaigns are conducted how? How did people try to get you to vote for one guy or the other? What was the main means by which we campaigned? How would you spread information? The through the newspaper. Very good. Campaigns are conducted through newspapers. Adams and the Federalists had their newspapers. Jefferson and the Republicans had their newspapers. Now, and if you think politics is nasty today, it was just as nasty, if not worse, 200 plus years ago. You read a Jeffersonian newspaper, Adams is a big fat idiot who wants to bring the United States back to England and is, wants to declare himself king, etc., etc. You read Adams's newspaper, Jefferson is an atheist wacko who wants to suck the United States into the French Revolution and cut rich people's heads off. Just as ridiculous as campaign advertising today. It's done in the newspapers. There's very little beyond that. You know, things that we associate with campaigns, speeches and stops and rallies and songs and buttons, don't exist in 1800. You pick your guy. Now, how are the guys picked? That's another interesting question. Adams and Jefferson. So, camp campaigns are conducted through newspapers. And candidates are picked, here's another really important thing, by the congressman. How do the Federalists pick Adams? How do the Republicans pick Jefferson? Well, they, their congressmen vote. All the congressmen in Congress get together, all the Federalist congressmen get together and say, OK, who are we going to run for president? Adams. Great idea. All the Republicans in Congress get together. Who are we going to have run for president? Jefferson. Great idea. They, that's how their their standard bearers are picked, and this is how the competitive elections of 1796, 1800, 1804, 1808, 1812 are conducted. 1816 and 1820 are unique in American history because by 1816, the Federalist Party is dead. There is no Federalist Party anymore. The War of 1812 killed it. 1816 and 1820, James Monroe pretty much is elected unopposed both times. Nobody really bothers to run against him. He calls himself a Republican, a Democrat Republican, a Jefferson Republican, and everyone's like, yeah, me too. Even the Federalists were calling themselves Republicans by that time. That the Federalists' economic policies had kind of won out, but in terms of the culture, Jefferson's Republican Party was where it was at. So, we have candidates not running for office because that looks ambitious. We have campaigns conducted through newspapers that kind of stand in for either candidate and we have candidates that are picked by their congressional caucus. Then you have the era of good feelings, two presidential elections where nobody really kind of runs. But the problem with that is there's still politics. People are still disagreeing on some important stuff. And that's going to come rear its head back up um, in the 
1824. Because 1824, we see the emergence of Jackson. Destroyer of the Indians, hero of the Battle of New Orleans, champion of the common man. All of these newly enfranchised, poor, working class type people see in Jackson something they've never seen in American politics before. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe are all elites. You are expected to, that the people in the middle are expected to vote for their betters. Men like Washington, men like Jefferson, men like Adams. They consider themselves to be on a higher plane than everybody else, and the people below them consider them to be below men like Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. There's this definite, even though we are kind of believers in equality, legal equality, there is a sense that, yeah, Washington is a better guy than me. Jefferson is a more educated, better guy than I am. The emergence of Jackson kind of starts to change that. And Jackson is going to win the hearts, minds, and votes of all of those people that the voting rules, when they changed, could now vote. Common man. Jackson loses the election of 1824. Um, it's a very complicated election. Basically, what happens is there's four people running. Jackson gets more votes than anybody else, but he does not win an electoral college majority. The election gets thrown to the House of Representatives. A deal may or may not have been cut, this is all in your notes, and John Quincy Adams is declared the president in 1824. Corrupt bargain, Jackson screams. He says that Adams and Henry Clay have conspired to keep him away from the presidency, and this is what is going to inaugurate his new style in American politics. Jackson says, Screw all of this. I'm going directly to the people. And Jackson spends the next four years campaigning against Adams. Question? No, um, I should have said that he might have been, isn't he John Adams' son? Yeah, John, John Adams' son, yes. It's John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams. His son was a very famous diplomat. He has another son who was very famous author. The Adams family has a long pedigree in American history. Was he a really in France or something like that? Probably. It was like an HBO special we watched. Yes. Okay, yeah. He brought, he brought his son over to France when he was young, sure. Yeah. Oh, there, like, are I'm sorry. Oh, he did all the movie it would be great. Probably. Was, uh, John Quincy. Yeah, John Quincy Adams is a. A guy who would never be elected president today. He was a mean, grouchy old guy, hated slavery, um, and was not really a people person. Did not like speaking in front of people, um, and would not be elected president. Do any of these like famous people have any descendants today? Yeah, oh, oh, the Adams. There's thousands of Adams. Yeah. Sam Adams. That was a cousin. Sam Adams is a cousin. <laughs> Same family though. Just different branch. The beer guy. In 1828, Jackson runs again against John Quincy Adams and wins. But by 1828, things are changing from that old kind of style campaigning that we saw. And we're going to see Jackson run as the champion of the common man. Jackson and all of his people start to have campaign rallies. They come out and they say, vote for Jackson, he's just like you. He's gonna help you, you know, do better in life. 
Let's have a big old party and celebrate General Jackson. And people would do that. And Jackson gets elected in 1828, kind of on that new style of campaigning. What does Jackson stand for? Let's make a little list here. Those of you who passed in Tom Free should know. What does a second party system Democrat like Andrew Jackson, he changes the name of the party from the Republicans to the Democrats. Democrat means what? Demos. What's demos? The people. All of you people, says Jackson. The common man enthroned. We are no longer deferring to elites. We are electing a guy whose parents were immigrants, whose father died when he was an infant. Mom, Jackson ran away to fight in the militia when he was 13 years old, got captured by the British with his older brother. The British said, shine my shoes. Jackson pretty much said, you, I'm not shining your shoes. This British officer took his sword and smashed Jackson across the face with the flat end of it. Left a giant scar on Jackson's face. His brother died in captivity. Jackson learned from that age at 13 to hate the British um, and hate the officer class. Um, Jackson is a good hater in a lot of ways. He has a very strong passion. He hates the Indians, uh, for one. Um, I don't he just thinks that they're savages. Uh, that are better off far away from Americans. Um, he certainly doesn't think that any Indians should stand in the way of the common man expanding and getting wealthier and growing new, establishing farms and towns and things like that. He believes in the common man. That the average ordinary person can run his affairs without the help of elites. He does not like anything that smacks of elitism, like the Second Bank of the United States. Hates the bank hates the tariff, because the tariff supports whom? Manufacturers. Manufacturers, wealthy businessmen, bankers, who he hates. He is anti-Indian, because in his view, the Indians are standing in the way of American expansion, the growth of the common man, his farm, his homestead. Anti-bank, anti-tariff, anti-Indian. Um, the strict construction of the Constitution. Because he thinks that a loose construction of the Constitution benefits whom? The elites. Well, a lot of people disagree with Jackson on this. And from this disagreement with Jackson comes the genesis of a new political party. The Whigs. The Whigs are simply, at first, a combination of anti-Jackson people. If you think of Whigs, if you're still studying for Sintom 3, which is most of you, the Whigs are just anti-Jackson people. Whatever Jackson stands for, they stand on the opposite side of it. They call themselves Whigs because they thought Jackson was becoming like a king. Jackson was the first president to use his veto all the time. Congress would pass things, Jackson, veto, veto, veto. And a lot of people said, you're violating the spirit that the legislature is supposed to make laws. You're not supposed to be vetoing everything that the representatives of the people are doing, President Jackson. Jack, veto, veto. They started calling him King Andrew. That's why they named themselves Whigs. Go back to British history. The Whigs are the party in Britain that stands against the king's party. So when Congress tried to make 
new laws back when it wouldn't make Veto, it. veto, yep. Jackson vetoed anything that he thought violated <laughs> this strict construction. Um, this is a time where a lot of Americans want to build roads, for example, that a lot of Americans want to build, have the federal government help build roads. Jackson looks at his constitution and says, I don't see anything there that says build roads and vetoes, road, road bills, vetoes canal bills, uh, because he thinks these things benefit wealthy, elite bankers and manufacturers and traders. Um, so that's why they're called the Whigs, because they think Jackson is acting like a king, because one of the king's powers is the veto power. That's why the president has a veto power, so the king of England did. Um, and the Whigs, you know, they're just anti-Jackson. They're pro-bank. They're pro-tariff. They are pro-internal improvements, and those internal improvements, those are the things like the roads and the canals and stuff. There's a movement uh, to build a national university, Jackson vetoes it. There's a move to build a national science foundation, Jackson vetoes it, um, on the grounds that it's unconstitutional. By, and now you have these two parties in opposition to each other, that are now going to bring American elections into the modern age. First of all, how we pick them becomes a little more democratic. All right? So, how do we pick candidates? They are picked by party caucus. What the hell is that? So the, at first we saw candidates picked by the congressional delegation. Now we are changing that the parties themselves become mass vehicles for political participation. So let's say, and this kind of goes with other things that are going on in American society at the same time. If you're a Jacksonian, Living in Elizabeth, just use Elizabeth, it's perfectly fine. Not that there's probably that many Jacksonians in Elizabeth, but we'll go with it. You're a Jacksonian living in Elizabeth. You are going to join the Elizabeth Democratic Party. And you would actually do stuff. You would have meetings every week. You'd elect a president of the Elizabeth Democratic Club. You know, you would write letters to the newspaper. This is why Jackson is awesome. So I am the Elizabeth Democratic Club. You would, you know, go around to your friends and try to, you know, bring them into the club. You would socialize together. You would make sure, wow, we have flying pens in the <laughs> We've accidentally thrown it, exploded out of the holder of the pen, clearly. The Elizabeth Democratic club, and I also am telling you also, guess what else there was? There was an Elizabeth Whig club. And those are some of the people that you would be, they would be your friends, you'd associate with them, you knew everyone in town who was a Democrat. The president of your club would be invited to the big national Democratic party, party, big party for the whole party, where those people, the party caucus, would pick a nominee. So let's say, for example, that this is the Democratic Club of Union, this is the Democratic Club of Elizabeth, the Democratic Club of Springfield, the Democratic Club of, of um, Westfield. All of the president of all of those local clubs would go to the New Jersey Democratic Club. And all 300 of you would get together and hang out, and you would pick 15 people to go to the National Party Caucus. So all of you, the 15 people from the whole state, go to this National Party Caucus, and you guys, from all the different states, the party leaders, 
They pick the candidate. Okay? Is it 100% democratic? No. No one's voted here. But is it more democratic than having the congressional delegation picking? Yes. Because, in the end, it's your, the president of your little club who goes, so it's, it's just a little indirect democracy, but it is more democratic than the way it had been. Party caucuses pick the nominees. And so, and this, this creates some fun arguments at party conventions because the New Jersey Democratic Club might have somebody they want to be president, but you know, the Mississippi Democratic Club might have somebody else, and you've got to kind of fight it out on the, at the convention. Um, we're going to look more at this when we look about, uh, at Lincoln. But they're picked by party caucuses. And this is how it's done until about the 1920s. That the party leaders, the party bosses, would get together, vote, and out of that meeting comes the candidate. That all the Democrats were then expected to vote for. The camp, so that's more democratic in that regard, that how we pick candidates becomes more democratic. The campaign style becomes more democratic. And I don't even know if democratic is a good thing in this regard. This is where, by the 1830s, by 1840 at the absolute latest, you have campaign rallies, campaign buttons, campaign slogans, campaign songs. All the stuff, you know, what's the difference between that and campaign internet memes and campaign Twitter feeds? There's really, the technology has changed, but the style certainly has not. In rallies, slogans, buttons, and songs, what is missing? What is not here? Which is the same as today. The president vote? I mean... No, no, okay, you know, that, but sure, then we can include that too. The candidates now campaign. They create what's known, what's known as a stump speech. A stump speech. Which is pretty much a speech that you give standing up on a tree stump. So the candidate would go from town to town. Everyone come over here, Jackson's going to talk. Everyone gathers around, Andrew Jackson jumps up on a tree stump and talks to the crowd. He goes to the next town and does what? Exactly the same thing. The stump speech, this is still a term that is used. The candidate gave a standard stump speech. Are the speeches different? No. They're not different because, especially in an age before you know recording and radio and television, the, pres the candidate is going to say the same thing in every single town. And he kind of, per right, all he changes is, here I am in Biloxi versus here I am in Mobile. You know, his little jokes for local color change, but that's it. When the president speaks as a candidate, when a guy is on the campaign trail, the speech is pretty much the same no matter where the hell he goes. He just changes, you know, nice to be here in New Jersey versus nice to be here in New Mexico. That's a stump speech. And the candidate gets good at it. Well, why? Because it's important. He gives it 30,000 times. Whether it's done on a stump, or whether it's done as it was from about the 1850s on, from the back of a railway car, it used to be the campaign that the candidates would go around on a train. And at every town, they would stop. The president wouldn't even get off the train. He'd just go to the back of the caboose, stand on the train platform, and, everyone, and he'd give his stump speech, the train would drive to the next town, and he'd do the same thing over again. This is how candidates campaigned well into the 1950s, on the back of trains, giving a stump speech, a standard 
speech that just kind of changes. But what's missing here is any in-depth discussion of the issues at hand. Vote for Art now in 1840, it gets completely out of hand. In 18, so the election of 1840 is kind of a big one because it finalizes all these changes that are happening. It's called the Log Cabin and Hard Cider Campaign. log cabin mean kind of an American folklore? If you're from a, who's from a log, who was born in a log cabin? Uh, oh, Lincoln. Lincoln's yeah, yeah, born in a log cabin. Talking down, yeah, down a tree. That's a little different. But the, the, oh, that was, that the was image great. of the log cabin means what? Canadians? No. What is, when, when you say that, when you have the image of a man Born in a log cabin. What does that kind of mean? Where is this guy from? The frontier. The frontier, the wilderness. He's born what? Poor. Here is a man that was born in a log cabin, moving all the way to the White House. We like that story. It's one of those things that, you know, Bill Clinton, in a lot of ways, ran a log cabin campaign. The man from Hope, whose father walked out, whose stepfather was killed in a car accident, whose mom was on his welfare. Bill Clinton makes that part of his story. It's true. We like our presidential candidates to kind of come from, it's just, it's what we like. We like to hear a rags to riches story. We like to believe that anybody born in a log cabin can one day be president of the United States. Hard cider is what? Alcohol. Yeah. A man who drinks hard cider and was born in a log cabin is a man just like you, Mr. Ordinary Citizen. Who are we talking to now? We are talking to this large number of people that now have the right to vote. People like to vote for people that they identify with. Ordinary, average Americans in the 1830s and 40s could identify with a man born in a log cabin that liked to drink alcohol. Why? Because most of them were born in log cabins and liked to drink alcohol. Now, whether the candidate was actually born in a log cabin or liked to drink alcohol is completely besides the point. William Henry Harrison in 1840, he runs the classic log cabin and hard cider campaign. He's born in a middle class house and prefers fine French wine. That's not important. What's important is how he is sold to this new electorate. And he is sold. Is this making an argument? No. There's no political argument here. In the election of 1840, there's no political argument. Our guy was born in a log cabin and likes to drink hard cider. Everyone who supports him wears a button on their lapel, we go to rallies, we chant his slogans, Tim Canoe and Tyler too. That's the slogan. William Henry Harrison's nickname is the, he, he's the hero of the Battle of Tip Canoe. Tip Canoe and his Vice President John Tyler. Tip Canoe and Tyler too. Do you know where the phrase OK comes from? Yeah. Oh, yeah the okay. Old Kinderhook. Old Kinderhook. Mrs. Drummond, can you please contact the main office? Mrs. Drummond, please contact the main office. Thank you. In the election of 1836, Martin Van Buren is running for president. He's Andrew Jackson's vice president. His nickname is Old Kinderhook, because he was from the town of Kinderhook in New York. So when you wanted to say that you were voting for Martin Van Buren, Old Kinderhook, you would say, it's okay for me. That's where the word okay came from. No, I thought it was just a club. That there was also this club that like, gentlemen yeah. used to go to, yeah, that it was okay, and that, like, yeah, that was like the initial or whatever. 
and that if you were from that club, you were cool, so you'd be okay. I've never heard that explanation. I've heard that, that one. Wasn't a movie, right? yeah, or yes. Yeah, well, as Abraham Lincoln once said, you can't believe everything you hear on the internet. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen that. What? That's the point. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the one I want to start, old Pinder. My point is, and to wrap this up, by 1840, we have candidates on the campaign trail selling stories about their personal history as opposed to their policies with rallies and buttons and songs and slogans. Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign had a song um, that, you know, a lot of you know, candidates do that sort of thing. Can't stop thinking about tomorrow was Clinton's. And it was like an actual song that he said, can I use this song for my campaign? And the artist said, yeah, I love you, Bill. Um, and that means every, every time Clinton landed in his plane, there's the song, out he comes, gives his stump speech where he tells his personal story, and there's what's missing from all of this, really, is in-depth discussions of the issues. Like the last... Like the last 180 years of presidential campaigns. That the stump speech is not in-depth politics. It's, my policies are awesome, the other guy's policies want to kill your grandma, vote for me. You know, there's no... This is how camp. This why is the election of 1840 considered to be the first modern campaign? Well, it's the first modern campaign. It has all of these things. It has stump speeches. It has the kind of the candidate's personal story as central to the narrative, etc., etc.